But tonight we're in Acts chapter 17, so if you've got your Bible there, go ahead and open it up and uh, I'll walk you through this. And I probably won't take a long time, is that okay? I, I, need, I need more votes on an okay. Is that okay if I don't take a long time? You're okay with that? That gives you more time to fellowship, <laughs> right. So what time am I supposed to quit? Tomorrow? No, it's tonight. What time? Okay, okay. Let's, let's see how close I can come to that. All right, Father God, I thank you for your word. The, the stories in the book of Acts have encouraged so many people, Lord. It's not what, what theologians would call deep, deep, you know, complicated theology. It's just the story of what you did through people like us that uh, fell in love with you and, and, and developed a love for the lost and decided to go tell somebody about you. And so, Father, I pray that these stories that we're going to read tonight would incite more stories that will come out of our life where we step into the crossroads where people are that are broken and hurting and in ang some of them in anguish, Lord God. And so, Father, I, I believe you want to use this tonight to prepare us to be used by you. And so we open our hearts to that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week was Easter. And the week before was Pastor Fausto. Don't you love Fausto? I mean, I could listen to him read a menu and I would enjoy it. And even if it was a German menu, I'd still enjoy just hearing his voice. He's such a, such a great brother. But he took you to Philippi. And now we're about to move on from Philippi. And I just want to get you an overview on the first. There's three sections in chapter 17. We're going to find ourselves in Thessalonica. And we're going to find ourselves in a, a place called Berea. And then we're going to find ourselves in Athens, Greece. And all of them were very significant and remarkable what God did. But the, the point of it all is that Paul didn't leave Philippi. And you saw this if you were here. How many of you were here two weeks ago? Anybody here for that? Paul didn't leave Philippi till God told him to leave Philippi. And he knew God was in charge of his travel plans. He did that before in Asia Minor too. When they kicked him out, they, they, they stoned him and left him for dead and he didn't die. And it's as if he says, I'm not done yet. And he goes right back into the place where they had tried to kill him and maybe did kill him. He might have been a resurrection story. But he says, I'm not done here till God says I'm done here. So in, in Philippi, the city leaders begged him to leave. Just get out of our, our city. Please go away. And Paul and his team were seen like a plague. They, they were seen like a virus. We, we don't want your Jesus. You're messing up our system. You're turning our whole system on its head. And so they, they knew that they were there not as the virus, but as the only cure for the virus. Not that they were the cure, but they brought the cure with them. Now, I don't know anything really about viruses. I don't know, and I even know less about vaccines, except there's a lot of turmoil over vaccines right now. People rushing to get them and people rushing to stay away from them. I understand both sides of, of the argument on that. But um, I do know this to a degree about viruses, about, um, I'm sorry, about vaccines. Then I'm not sure if it's always true. Are there any medical people here? Rebuke me if any of this sounds wrong. My understanding is that a vaccine is a little dose of the disease. And they inject the disease into you and your body fights the manageable dose and you build up the immunities to it. Well, the cure for the virus of sin that breaks us all is not a, is not a little dose of sin to make you immune to it. It's the dose of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that cancels that sin. Talk about things being canceled. Let's cancel the hold and the power of sin over us. And that only happens because of the blood of Jesus. So Paul's been at Philippi and he stayed long enough, it, it tells us in, in the, the last chapter, to, to encourage the brethren. He, he, he says, I'm not ready to leave. And so he goes to the house of Lydia and he says, okay, encourage, encourage, encourage. I encourage you. I encourage you. I encourage you. What do you think he did to encourage them? Well, what kind of things do you think he told them? What, what have they just seen? They've seen the, the, the voice that brought them the gospel beat up prison, you know, stuffed into prison. And then this whole earthquake thing happens. What do you think he might have said to them to encourage them in their new walk with Jesus Christ? Is this somebody shouted out? Anything. Even if you're making it up. 
I think he was encouraging them to, I'll get you started, to keep loving Jesus. And now they're followers of Jesus, so what's he going to tell them to do? Keep following him, keep loving him. Well, what about the city that's left to be reached? Yeah, he will tell somebody about Jesus. And, and what have they seen happen to him who came to tell them about Jesus? They got in trouble. And he's not going to tell them, you'll never get in trouble. If you need, because Jesus loves you so much, he'll keep all trouble away from you. I, I think he probably encouraged them, you know, there may be a day that you'll have to suffer. There may be a day that you'll be thrown into prison like me. He, he might have even told them, I have friends from Asia Minor that were killed because of the gospel. He might even tell them, and I was the source of some of them that died. When I went around and I tried to stop this Jesus movement. And I, I, just, I can imagine all of that, encouraging them to remain strong and to endure temptation and encouraging them by all means to preach the gospel. And then he moves on down the, on, on down the track. But the next leg of the journey is going to take him to these three cities. And he, it, it's very interesting. It says he passes through two cities on the way. Why would he pass through them? Isn't he out to tell everybody about Jesus? Why would he not stop in these two cities, Amphipolis and Amphipolis, is, I think it's, am I pronouncing it wrong? Amphipolis. Amphipolis means loud city or loud people. Why would he pass through there and pass through Apollonia, which was named after Apollos? What do you think? Why didn't he stop there? Talk to me. Talk to me. Why do you think? <laughs> they had weird sounding name. He didn't want to stop in a place that was called loud people. No, I, I don't know. The spirit told him not to. I think it was the only reason. You remember that happened when he was moving through what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor. He said, God, I want to go tell those people in the north. The Lord said, no. I want to go to, to, to that place in the south. No. And so he just keeps moving till he's up against the sea. And God says, now you're heading in the right direction. And I think the point of this whole thing is that you've got to listen to God. How many of you want your life to be used by Jesus? You know, in a crowd like this, you almost feel obligated to raise your hand, right? But I hope, it's, I hope you really mean that. And if you want to be used by Jesus, then you need to stay in step with him and listen to what his spirit says. And he's not going to tell you yes with every person that you see, but he'll tell you yes to some. And he'll put them, I believe, right in the middle of your road. So the next leg in this journey is going to cause him to pass through two cities full of people that need Jesus. But he's not the guy. And it wasn't because there wasn't a synagogue in the town. You know, Paul loved to stop in synagogues. When he went to Philippi, there wasn't a synagogue. But God says, here now. And so he, he rooted in there for a while and he brought them the gospel. And, and Paul wasn't the one to bring the gospel to Amphipolis, the loud people, or to Apollonia. So why did they pass by? It wasn't because it was funny sounding names or, or anything else. You know, the, I, I would ask the question, looking back on my own life, why did God tell me to come to Huntington Beach? I tell you, I didn't want to come to Huntington Beach. I didn't want to come to Orange County. I didn't want to live in California again. I wanted to go back to a place where there wasn't much going on, not just come and be another one of the 10,000 pastors in, a, you know, in Southern California. But I, I came to understand um, after a while of being here exactly why God brought us. And I've sh shared this story so many times. But I came to a church that was a very loving church and they were a Bible teaching church. There's no question about that. But the church had no mission vision. And not even much of an evangelism vision for the city of Huntington Beach. And so I knew that God sent a missionary that would rather be on another mission field. He sent me here. And I got up on a Sunday morning, first Sunday in, in, uh, in June of 1997. And I, uh, I was 16 years old at that time. No, a little bit older. But I got up and I said, you're getting a pastor that would rather be a missionary somewhere else, somewhere else besides here. I told him, I don't really want to be here. <laughs> That's not a great way to start on your first Sunday. But I said, but I, but I am now thrilled to be here because I know God sent me. And I told him this, if God won't let me go to the mission field, then he sent me here to send you there. Because there's places that need to be reached and people that need to hear. And so that's why 
God will sometimes take you to a place where you, you have a much better idea than he did. Why did he take me to Huntington Beach? Why did he tell us to plant a church in Desert Hot Springs, California? How many of you know where Desert Hot Springs is? Just a few of you, yeah. And he told us to go to Albuquerque. Then he took us to Melbourne, Australia. This is kind of backwards. Why would he take me to Romania? I, I don't speak much Romanian. Uh, I think I think I said, God bless you. I hope I, I didn't cuss you out or anything like that. I think I, I got that right. But he took us there to love orphans that were on the street. One night at the end of our, our trip, we're, we're heading back the next day, getting on the plane. We took our, our uh, translator to the, the, the train. On the way back, these little street kids are coming up to us asking for money. We said, well, what do you need money for? And he said, uh, we want to buy some pizza. I said, we'll buy you pizza. Where's the pizza place? We, and by the time we started, maybe took 20 more steps, the guys that we were taking to buy pizza were motioning to others behind us. And then there were about five or six of them. By the time we got to the pizza place, there were a dozen of them. And we got to tell them about Jesus and how much he loved them. One of the guys that was with us went back to that same city and planted an orphanage. That's why God took us to Romania. He had something for us to do. The same story is going to be true for you. There's one reason why Paul skipped Amphipolis and Apollonia, because God did not give him the green light. And he'll give you a green light. He'll send you one place or another. So where did they end up? They pass by Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they land in a place called Thessalonica. Open up your Bible to 17, Acts 17, and I'm going to skim over these first two because I want to stop with you tonight in Athens. It's a remarkable story that I think is sometimes really misunderstood. So in verses 1 down through 9, I'm just going to really even skim it. We're not going to read the whole thing. Three Sabbath days. Now, some people think, how in the world could he have done all that he did in three weeks? Maybe he was there for a month. He got there after the Sabbath day, stayed for three, and left after that last Sabbath day. Oh, God did a remarkably quick work. Some people kind of have the idea that it doesn't mean they were three consecutive Sabbath days, but they were spread over a period of time. Why would they think that? Well, because God has to give him more time to start a Jesus movement in Thessalonica like the one that started. I don't think so. I think it happened in that three-week period of time. He comes in and he preaches the gospel. Some Jews get saved. He's in a synagogue. And he loved to go to the synagogue because they spoke the same language. And he came and would tell, him, tell his people, open up your, your, your scrolls or your Bible. Roll it on over to Jeremiah 31, 31. Let me tell you about the new covenant that was going to come. And he had the attention of the Jews who knew their Bible. And God did a remarkable work there. Uh, it says that uh, um, some of the Jews got saved and then a great multitude of Greek-fearing, or God -fearing, not Greek-fearing, God-fearing Greeks, not Greek-fearing gods, but the, the God-fearing Greeks get saved. And I love this phrase. It says, I think it's around verse 3 or 4, it says, and a bunch of prominent women. There's something about the prominent women in a town, the respected women in the town, that were respected as, as fine, upstanding pillars. And they're probably the upstanding women that could take care of all those kids on the street that were, you were goofing around where they shouldn't be goofing around. But they were respected. And so some Jews get saved. A bunch of Greeks get saved who really did believe in God. And they heard the gospel, responded. And a bunch of women got saved that were of, of high standing. And that's a church plant. And the Jewish men who were not saved became so jealous of Paul's impact, they started a riot. It happens everywhere Paul goes. Repeat after me. Revival. Riot. Revival. Riot. Do it 20 more times, and that's the sum total of Paul's ministry. He'd come to town, preach the gospel. People would repent. Revival happens. And then the riot, the, the thugs come out to, to chase them out of town. And I love their accusation. It's in verse 6. And they, they say, some of the Jewish men who were not saved, they, they got together this hired mob from the, the town square. And in verse 6, here's what they say to the crowd. These people who have flipped the world upside down have come here now. Well, I, I would love that accusation to be true of me. To go into a town and turn that town upside down. 
It's not really upside down, is it? It's the other way. It's already upside down. Every town, every city is upside down. Every soul is upside down until they come to Christ. And they come there, and I just love the accusation. They've messed up our town. They've messed up our system upside down. Seems like everywhere where the Jesus movement really gets started, and even today where it's really challenged, on campus after campus, and in all the corners of our culture, Christians are called backwards and brainless and even mentally ill, following this Santa Claus God in the sky from those who don't understand the love of God for us. The world is upside down, and we just get used to it, don't we? We get used to a backward culture that's got every, they've jettisoned everything that has to do with truth, and they have to replace it with something they call truth, which is not truth. And you see it over and over again. So they get chased out of town, but they're not done. The next stop, and you'll see it, is verse 10 down through verse 13. And they stop in Berea. Not Brea, but Berea. They get to Berea, and the thing you find out about the people in Berea, it was one of the larger towns in that region, in Macedonia, um, there, there was, a, a, there was a, an, another synagogue launched there where Paul goes into the synagogue and, and it takes hold. And it's the same kind of thing. Again, some of the prominent women come to faith and some of the Jews come to faith. But it says this about the Bereans. You ever heard anybody say to you, be a good Berean? Anybody heard that phrase? Be a Berean. You know what it means? It means study your Bible. Get to know the word of God. And it tells us this about the Bereans, that they were more fair-minded. It was a little easier than the people in Thessalonica. And so they said, well, tell us what you have. And he took them to Jeremiah 31, 31. And he took them to all the prophecies about the Messiah. They were fair-minded. They received the word eagerly. They were probably like you the night or the day that you got saved. I, I, I know that the night I got saved, I was waiting to hear truth, but I didn't think I'd hear it in the, in, in the form of the gospel. Uh, people were telling me, you can find truth here, you can find truth there. And I was chasing some of these dead ends, or chasing truth down some of these dead ends, as long as it didn't have anything to do with Jesus, because I thought I'd had my Jesus fill. But I'll tell you, that night when I heard the gospel, that's what this empty, hungry heart was waiting to hear. Because somebody like you, somebody like you guys right here, told me, they had the courage to come and tell me, Bill, it's Jesus you're looking for. It's Jesus you're looking for. And, and, and something opened up that night and I came in. So these guys were fair-minded. They received the word eagerly and they checked their Bibles to see if what Paul was preaching was really in there. I think I've, I've told this story recently. Um, there was a Jewish guy that came to one of our outdoor services we held once in, uh, um, over in the amphitheater at, uh, at Golden West College. Actually, no, no. He came to that a, a couple of weeks later on Easter. It was at the old building over on McFadden. And he came because he was invited to come to a, a baby dedication by his Christian friends. And he was Jewish. He thought it was going to be something like a circumcision service. I think they call that a bris or something like that. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. He said, we'll, we'll go in. It'll be done. The, the preacher will do his little thing. He'll make the sign of the cross and we'll be on our way. He didn't know he had to sit for 45 minutes and listen to me preach the gospel. And hear a, a group of people worshiping. But there he was and he was stuck because he was too nice to walk out and he was too kind to his friends. And so I got a call from him, a, a voicemail and I listened to it on my way home, and he said, we need to talk. He said, you stand for everything I've despised all of my life. He said, but something you said today stuck with me, and I got a problem with you, and I want to talk to you. <laughs> I wasn't running with eagerness to that meeting, but I said, I'll meet you at a Starbucks. I wanted to keep it public, just in case. <laughs> but I went to the Starbucks, and I, and I took this little... Um, compact Bible that I had, and I opened up to, I've mentioned it twice, where did I open up to? Jeremiah 31, 31. And, and I said to him, Ross, look, it says right here, and we, we got to this in a moment, but I said, it says right here that there would be another covenant coming, a new covenant. And Ross was a really, really, really big guy. You, you could take probably at least two of us here and put, to, put us together, and we still weren't as big as Ross was. He's in heaven now. But I remember this little little table we were sitting at in, in Starbucks out at, at uh, Brookhurst in Edinger. And I showed that to him and I read it to him. And he leaned into that table and his girth pushed that table into my girth. And he said, that's in there? 
He said, that's really in there? And I said, yeah, it's in there. God knew we couldn't keep the law. And so we're saved by grace, not by law, because of Jesus' death on the cross. And he said, can I borrow that book? I never thought I'd ever get it back. But he brought it back to me one day as he got another one. But when he heard the gospel, he was eager to hear that his sins could be forgiven. That was the Bereans. They went and checked it out in the, Lord, in, in the word of God. So when they found out that it was all right there all that time, they believed. And another church is planted. More Jews and Greeks and prominent women coming to Christ. And then another, after the revival, another what? Another riot. And it says that the same thugs from Thessalonica heard that 35 or 40 miles away, Paul had just gone down the track and he's preaching the gospel there. And so they said, boys, jump on your horses and let's take the posse to the West. And so they did. And they did the same thing there. They busted some heads and they tried to stop this thing. And so what happens there at the very tail end of it, look at verse 14. And that's where we'll start reading. It says, then immediately the brethren sent Paul away. It's like, Paul, we've got to get you out of town. They sent him away to go to the sea, but Silas and Timothy, his traveling partners, they remained there in Berea. And so those who conducted Paul brought him by ship. They brought him to Athens and received a command for Silas and Timothy to come to join him with all speed. And they departed. So he sends back word. Now it's going to take a while. It's about 250 miles by, by, by boat as you come down the coast of Macedonia, then to Greece. And you sort of go off to the west at one point where there's a, a long barrier island and you're in the inland waters and you can get all the way down to Athens, about 250, 260 miles. And as soon as he gets there, he tells the ship's captain and the, the, the crew, you're going back to Berea, right? Yeah. Tell my buddies to get down here as quickly as they can. And they come by, by road. So however long it takes to do two or 300 miles down, two or 300 miles back up, and then the boys to walk south. It's probably got to be at least two to three weeks before they come down to join him. But they made their way. And look at this. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens... His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. It was full of religions, contradictory religions, contradicting, contradictory to one another. And, and, and it, they were everywhere. It, it was said that there were more gods in Athens than there were men. That's not hyperbole. That's true. There were more idols everywhere than there were people. Every, every person in Athens... And, and, and by this time, it was under Roman rule. And Rome would let you keep whatever gods you had as long as you paid your taxes. <laughs> and, and so you'd go into somebody's house and they would have a, a shelf somewhere, maybe like a, above their doorway or maybe in their kitchen. They'd have a little shelf with these little icons or statues or rocks that were somehow a, a point of reference to the gods that they worshipped. I've, I've talked about this recently. You, you would have three gods for your door, one for the threshold, one for the hinges, and, and one for the doorway itself to keep you and to protect you, to let no evil come your way. So one household could have 20 gods. And they saw, as he said, he saw a city that was completely given over to idolatry. Now look at what it says after that. It says he was provoked. His spirit was provoked. It disturbed him when he saw people in bondage to all these false gods. And therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. I love that about Paul. He sees a mess of a city. He sees a cultural mess. He sees a religious mess. He sees people just in, enslaved to their gods. But don't, don't pass by that one phrase where it says it provoked him that he saw a city wholly given over to idols. I don't think he was just counting the statues. I think he was watching the lifestyles. And I could tell you what he would see to, to a degree. Those who worship the god Bacchus... They were the town drunks. Because in order to worship Bacchus, you did what Bacchus did. You drank what Bacchus provided, the wine, and you would drink yourself silly. He saw those who worshipped Aphrodite and the other sex gods. 
He'd see the, the prostitutes coming down into the city to tempt the men to, to come up and worship with them, and the worship involves sexual activity. He saw people that, oh, I, I'm not sure if I can remember the name of this, this god, a Sibylle. And those who worship Sibylle, he'd see the scars on their arms and their bodies where they cut themselves to draw blood in worship to Sibylle. He saw those who worshiped Apollos. If you worshiped Apollos, you, you, could, you could have any kind of sex that you wanted because, because Apollos was by, you know, he, he was, what's the word I'm looking for? He swung both ways. He, he, was, he was gay at some times. He was just promiscuous at other times. You could have any kind of sex you wanted to if you worshiped that God. And it broke his heart. It didn't just frustrate him. He didn't just look around the town and say, oh, the government that lets people do anything they want to do. He saw people enslaved to gods and goddesses that would destroy them. And so he, he began to preach without permission. <laughs> he didn't ask, he didn't go to, the town, to the, the town square or the city hall and say, can I get a preaching permit to preach on the streets? They didn't pass those out anyway. He just, he just jumped in without permission, and it's going to cause trouble. It will cause trouble. I was, uh, I was walking, uh, I think it was Saturday morning. Is it either Friday or Saturday? Sa Saturday morning. Um, no, it was Friday. Down on the beach down here. And um, I got all the way down to the end of Surfside where the jetty is. And you go, if you can walk across the water, which you can't, Seal Beach is on the other side. So I get there, and I've always wanted to walk out to the end of the jetty. You know, I've walked out the jetty, but I haven't walked to the end, and I always wanted to walk out. It's a, a little over half a mile out there. And so I, I come up to the fence, and this fence has a sign on it on the other side of the fence that says, you can't go there. And so I didn't go there. It said, restricted area, no trespassing, do not enter. Why do they have to say it three ways? It should be enough to say, restricted area, you know, don't, without even saying don't come in. The good law-abiding citizens just won't go there. So I didn't go there. But I walked out the jetty until the, the fence ended and there were no signs. So I just kept walking and walking and walking and walking. And I almost got to the very end, maybe 30 yards from the end. And I hear a siren. Well, I think the siren is probably a fire truck going up PCH. So I didn't even turn around to look. And, and then it got louder and louder. It sounded like it was getting closer to me. And then I heard a loud speaker that says, you are in restricted area. Go back to where you came from. And I thought, Cincinnati, Ohio? What, all the way to Ohio? But I turned around and there was a gunboat coming for me. It was a, a, one of those little fast like speedboats coming up to me saying, turn around and go back the other way. You're in restricted areas. So I turned around right away and I headed back. I wasn't happy about not making my destination. But at one point, I stopped and I rested for just a minute because I really needed to rest for just a moment because I was moving quickly to get back there. And then another gunboat comes out after me. So now there's two gunboats and there's big guns on both sides of this boat. And they told me again, you need to go back. And I said, I am going back. I'm just resting. You know my heart, old man. But does, and, and I'm walking back down the jetty and I see at the end of the jetty, there's two military police and a local police and they're waiting to, I hope, just talk to me, not arrest me. But we had quite a long conversation. And, and they said, you're in a restricted area. And I said, how would I know that? I said, there weren't any signs anywhere that I, I passed by. I didn't go through the fence. I, I went out the jetty. So anyway, they said, you got a good point there. And they said, we're not even going to write you up. But I went where I wasn't supposed to be. And, and that's where Paul is. Do you see how clever I put that together? It didn't really make sense. But I've been dying to tell somebody that story since Friday. So you're my victims. But Paul went in and he went where it was restricted area. He went in where the, the locals would say, no, 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 we don't need you here. No trespassing here. He said, turn around, go back to where you came from. Go back to Tarsus, Paul. But he goes in and because his heart is broken for the people of this city. Now follow along with me and I'll read through this quickly. It says, so he, he's reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews. Yes, there were synagogues, not just one. There were many synagogues in a city the size of Athens. Synagogues were local churches. They didn't try to make them huge. They served the people in the neighborhoods that they lived in. Do you know why? 
Because as a Jew, you couldn't walk more than three quarters of a mile on a Sabbath. So they would make sure there were enough you know, uh, synagogues where you could walk to and from church and not violate the, the mileage rule on a, on a, uh, on a, on a, on a Friday. Or not a, yeah, on a Friday, on a Sabbath. And so there, he's reasoning with them and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So he's not just talking to Jews. He's talking to the worshipers of Sibylle with all their scars. He's talking to the worshipers of Bacchus and all the other gods. I've got hope for you. I've got news. And then it says, then the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers, they were two different camps of philosophers. They encountered him and some said, now this is meant to be a mockery. What does this babbler want to say? What's this babbler have to say to us? Others said, oh, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. Well, my goodness, there were an awful lot of foreign gods there already because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Everybody say Jesus and the resurrection. If you, if you haven't preached the cross and the resurrection, you haven't preached Christ. The gospel is about the death of Jesus Christ, not just the works of Jesus Christ. Not just about his preaching, but his, his sacrificial death, substitutionary death for you and me. He died in my place and he rose from the dead. And they say he's got this strange idea about a Jesus that rose from the dead. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. I think they were genuinely interested. Because they're now in a place of higher learning. And they want to hear everything from every corner of the world. They want to know what, what's happening in the north and the south, the east and the west, and down there in Africa, and whatever happens off the end of the earth. They want to know, from, they want to know what's happening everywhere. And so they took him and brought him up to the hill, Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For, we, for, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. And therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You know what it was at the Areopagus? Every day, it was story time. Wherever you're from, tell us your story. Oh, we love to hear stories. Doesn't need to make sense. Just entertain us. And so they'd bring in their ideas about God and their ideas about life and how to have a better life and, and you know, how, how to clear away the clutter in your life and what sparks joy for you and all, all, the, all these new things. But he says, for all the Athenians, they're always ready for a new thing. And then Paul stood. Now this, I'm going to read his, his sermon. It's brief, but I'm going to read his sermon intact. It is powerful. It's wonderful. People say he didn't preach the gospel. He'd already preached the gospel in the town. He'd been preaching about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So Paul stood in the midst of them, verse 22, in the midst of the Areopagus, and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. <laughs> See how he starts with a compliment? He doesn't attack them immediately. He says, You're very religious people. This is a religious center a vortex of all this religiosity. He said, for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship and I even found an altar with this inscription. Read it, read it with me there. To the unknown God. And as Paul is walking through, through Athens, knee deep in Greece, in, in, in Athens, he comes to this, this one altar and it has an inscription. It says, to the God we don't know. And Paul says, I've, I've got the beginning of my sermon right now. I know where I'm going to start. And he says this, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, I want to talk to you about him. Him, I proclaim to you. There's some differences of opinion on what that altar was all about. Some say that it was even just this great big piece of space rock that somehow had fallen in that region um, and, and it, ha it didn't happen at a particular, it had been there for a long, long time, and people worshipped it because it came from outer space. And, well, the gods must have sent this rock down to us. And at some time in their history, a plague, it's interesting about plagues, huh? A plague hit their region, and people were dying right and left. And they couldn't figure out what it was, and they sacrificed to every god they could think of. And somebody said, what about that rock? That was sent to us from outer space. 
Whatever God that is, let's go make sacrifices to the God that we don't know. Now, the story goes, when they sacrificed to that God, the plague stopped. The God they didn't have a name for, that the plague stopped. They still didn't have a name for him. There wasn't a, a, a big religious system built around it, but they said there must be a God that we don't know because Zeus didn't stop it. And Sibylle didn't stop it. Aphrodite didn't stop it. Pluto, no, that's a dog. Apollos didn't stop it until we, until we called out just in desperation on the God that we don't know. And it stopped. The God who stops death. And so... He says, I want to talk to you about the God that you don't know, the God that stops death. And he says, God who, now here's, listen to this message, God who made the world and everything in it. He's starting in Genesis, isn't he? Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And I can just see Paul pointing out the temples on the Areopagus. He says, God doesn't live in houses like that. He doesn't need a house here. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And, he's, and he has made from one blood. Oh, I love this passage. We talk about the races on planet Earth. There's one race on planet Earth. It's a human race. And there's differences in our skin color. But you cut us and we all bleed red. He said, our God, this God, He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. And this is a, such a great phrase. Though he's not far from each one of us. He's here. He's going to tell him he walked here among us. And I love that, that, that development. He said, in, in the hope, God did this in the hope that you would reach out for him, you'd grope for him, and you would find him. Though he's not hiding from you, he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And that really is true. There's a difference, in being, difference between being the offspring of God in one sense and the blood-purchased sons and daughters of God. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God in a way that you aren't right now if you're not saved, if you haven't surrendered your life to him. You're his people. You're his creation. You're his offspring. He gave you life. He gave you physical life. But there's something better than physical life. It's abundant, eternal life. Amen? And that's what all of, all of us need here. That's what all of our friends and all of our family, including crazy Uncle Harry or whatever crazy uncle or aunt you've got, they need the same thing. They were made by God to know God and to worship God. And so he says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold. And I think he's pointing at gold and silver and stones and something shaped by art and man's devising. Jeremiah really jumps down on this when he talks about the foolishness of, of you making a God or your favorite artisan, an artist making a God with his own hands and carving ears that can't hear and carving eyes that can't see and hands that can't move and a mouth that doesn't breathe. How foolish can we get? You make something with your own hands and you call it your God. There's a powerful verse. And I've got to find it again one day and locate it and get, get my Velcro fixed in my brain and hold on to it. But it's the place where the prophet is saying to someone who's holding an idol in their hands and saying, you're so foolish, you can't even say that that thing in your right hand is a lie. That it's a false God. This thing that you've created and you've thrown your life to and maybe thrown your life away over. He said, we ought not to think that the, the divine nature is like anything we've made, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked. God is so patient, so patient. He overlooked, but now commands all men. Now he's, he's going to get in deep right here. He's going to get deeper in the grease of Greece right here. When he says to these people, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. 
including you men and women in Athens and Huntington Beach. He says he has life for you. He's got the gift of life, the gift of salvation for you. But to get that gift of salvation, you have to repent and turn from the lie. And I'll wrap up here real quick. It says, truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he calls us to repent. Repent is a beautiful word. <laughs> it's, I'll tell you what repent is. It's a siren you hear from us, from the gun, you hear from the gunboat that's coming to you as you're out on the jetty. And it says, turn around and go back in the right direction. Go back. It, it, repent is just God saying, come back to me. Run to me. Don't run from me. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, Christ. And he's given assurance of, of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, this is sad, some mocked, while others said, we want to hear more. We'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. He'd had his day in court. He had his day where every preacher wants to preach in the university. Right in the, in the, in the, the, the inner square, the, the, what do they call that? The quad of the university, come and preach Jesus to us. He's had his day. And then it says he departed. Some people say we want to hear more. Others mocked him. And then verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Areopagite, a person that worked up on, the, on the, the, that, mount, that mount where all these temples were, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. You know what some people have said? I'm going to say it very lightly. I don't want to put anybody down. They've said, Paul failed in Athens. I would love to fail like Paul failed in Athens. Because I, I read at least four people that day got saved. Four people said, I believe. That's a good day with the gospel. When one soul believes. I'll tell you, it's a good day with the gospel if nobody believes, but you know you've spoken the truth in a loving way to people. And so Paul hits Athens. He hits Greece. And this thing launches. And there is going to be a work in Athens. It's not going to be like what happens down the, down the track in Corinth. And yes, Paul, it says when he went to Corinth, he was determined to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But I don't think Paul says, oh, I blew it in Athens. Because he could give you the names of the people that got saved. He came to them on their terms and he spoke to them in terms that they could understand. His mission to Athens, I think it was successful. It wasn't great numbers. But how many of you got saved in... Uh, Oh, let's say, how many of you got saved in a church service where there was an invitation and you raised your hand, you said, I want Jesus, and you prayed with a crowd of people? Let me see those hands. How many people got saved with just you and another person who shared the gospel with you? How many of you, somebody brought you to Jesus? Was that a bad day? Oh my goodness, no, that wasn't a bad day. That was a remarkable day because somebody faithfully preached Jesus to you. So I want to encourage you, whether you find yourself in Berea or whether you find yourself in Thessalonica or Philippi and they want you to leave town. Don't, don't leave, you know, with your tail tucked between your legs and your head hanging down. If you got a chance to share the gospel with somebody, if you get an invitation to, to Mars Hill and you get to go up there and preach the truth of Jesus Christ and tell them, I know about the God, you know, nothing about that. He loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. And there's a hope of eternal life for you. Jump on it. Jump into your greasy <laughs> opportunity in whatever Greece you go to, whatever opportunity, whatever crossroads, and preach Jesus. Amen. Father God, I thank you for the story of this brother of ours, Paul, and, and his, uh, his team, Lord, as they went from one place to another. And oh, Lord, I pray that, that, that you'd find us ready to take the next assignment you give us, Lord. Not running from it, but running to it, Lord. And that we'd be obedient too when you say, no, pass by this place. This is not the stop for you. Help us to have a sensitivity in our heart, Lord, to hear you clearly. And we thank you, Father, that the gospel made its way to us. So, Father, I pray for anybody here tonight that would say, man, I'm just ready. I've been waiting to hear that my sins could be forgiven and that it's been accomplished by Jesus. If this would be the night they just humble their heart, open their, their mouth and speak to you and surrender their life to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Bless you guys. Thanks for opening your Bibles with me tonight.